Yeah, so if we, uh, as Naveen also said, so mostly yeah, e-commerce kind of uh, applications or any where the logical should perform, basically like say where include the web application app, your front end, back end, and your database servers. And we have a UI in case in that UI, if you want to perform any logical operations where you can calculate something in the back end, like any like any product information or any mathematical calculation like your results or something or more than that, any product based platform. So where we can use this kind of uh, architecture to host the three tier applications. So when we talk about the three tier architecture, we will definitely go through the detail part and the architecture diagram. But in general, apart from the EC2 based three tier architecture, uh, three tier architecture, we can also use microservices on the top of that and the additional part. I mean, where your container will be involved, where your Lambda function API gateway will be involved as a middle layer and your backend definitely there will be a database server or it can be MySQL server. It can be DynamoDB. It's a depend on the what kind of project you have or the module which you are building basically. OK, so just uh, don't consider like uh, when we talk about the three tier architecture, it can be only uh, monolithic application like your EC2 based system. OK, it can be microservices as well. So in future, so if I able to successfully configure that project, which is completely based on the Kubernetes and where the other microservices use. So I will definitely show you that project in the live. OK, how we can build that. But today we are talking about the EC2 based applications where we build three tier architecture. We will first understand the layers basically, then architecture diagram, the tech stack required on to configure that, and how we can auto scale and scalability. Like, if you talk about the scalability or the some assignment, basically, if someone asks you like how how you can build the architecture diagram for the three tier architecture, and what things you will consider in that as I mean tech stack. So how you can on board basis you will consider that and why you deciding that factor. OK, so those all the details we will consider today. If anything comes to you like any my doubts in your mind, just let me know. OK, or if you can note down and ask me after the end of session, you can definitely welcome. And because this is something a bigger project, like we we, we the lots of things involved there in the networking site and the setups. So don't get distracted. OK, if you have any mobiles, you can keep on a silent mode because if you miss any some part of the piece, so you will get a end of the confusion. So that's a uh, lots of configuration is involved in this three tier architecture. That is the reason. OK, so just try to be uh, focused on this session. So let me start recording. I have already started. So let me share my screen. And thanks to you guys actually uh, because uh, from the couple of years I tried to build this data architecture. I know the concept wise like how we can do that, but um, finally uh, with, with the based on the real time project, which I already working on the real time project, which built on the three data architecture, but on the self system, which I built completely. OK, on the three data architecture module. So going forward, you will see through the pipeline as well. So as of now, I have not set up any Jenkins pipeline for the complete de deployment flow. But as I mentioned, some CICD pipeline projects, so we will definitely see that as well. So we will not do any changes through the manual or console base. We will create the infrastructure through the CD, uh, CDK or Terraform. OK. And we will deploy our application code through the pipeline, not the manual like copy paste. So that we will see going forward. So we can go step by step, uh, move away. Uh, like uh, first, we, we I'm just considering the simple project, then advanced, and then expert level. So which we can see more complex level project there. So we'll see. Okay, I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Okay. So let's go to first theoretical part. So then I can come to that architecture diagram. So for three tier architecture, we can consider web app and database. App will be your middle layer, okay, where uh, basically request comes from the front end and based on the request from the user. So in the back end system, front end will connect to the middleware, which is the app server. Whatever the perform uh, logical operations there, that will be performed. Then app your uh, 
based on the expected output so app will connect to the, your database servers and whatever the expected output required from the uh, for the user end user who are trying to get some information so that will happen here between app and database and your output will be you will see here at the, on the ui base front end if you see the problem statement like a designer scalable secure and high available three tier architecture for e-commerce web applications for example as we talk about that product based applications then the architecture should support dynamic content handle peak loads efficiently which is part of the infrastructure side okay and ensure your data integrity and security maintain a backup and disaster recovery let me correct this font so we basically required the backup and backup for the any disaster recovery to restore that then data integrity security which is the you might aware about the cdn cloud front for the low handling the loads kms for the data encryptions and other uh, encryption service okay so that part of the K K w uh, sorry aws which we can use kms service for the data encryption and scalability and availability let me check who is joining okay okay scalability and availability the application should be able to handle sudden spikes in the traffic specifically during sales and promotions okay ensure high availability and fault tolerance to provide any uninterrupted user experience which we can talk about the auto scaling if something happen like let's say you configure the single servers and suddenly spike there will there is a spike on the traffic so how you can how many projects you can handle the manual way right so in that case we can use auto scaling here to configure that automatic scaling scale up or scale down based on the user traffic on the uh, we can call and configure the matrix as a based on the cpu utilization as well okay security ensure sec communication secure communication between different layers which we talk about the web app and database layer and component of the architecture protect sensitive user data including personal and payment information which we can use kms here implement security best practices for data at rest in transit okay cost effectiveness definitely when we think about the architecture diagram so we also need to think about the cost as well just don't go blindly and create any high uh, configuration servers okay that will be uh, not a not, uh, not a good practice so when we design the architecture as a solution architect in your project or your tech lead or something so we need to take care of that as well like uh, how we can optimize the cost if this is the long term for project so configuration wise definitely we can go with that like right size in the configuration like unnecessary don't create the huge configuration servers as a startup okay going forward based on the utilization you can definitely increase that capacity but as a first level you can just think about that like you can go with the small configuration then gradually if you see like really the optimization is required then you can go with this higher configuration okay also, you can think about the reserve instance there. Like, let's say you have a longer term project to one year, two year. So, okay. So, in that mind, you can think about that reserve instance for the cost saving. Okay. So, that you will get almost 50% discount over there. Performance optimized for low latency and high throughput. Ensure the applications can deliver a responsive and faster user experience. Can anyone answer me on this? Which tech stack you can use for this situation? based on your experience or idea. This you can consider as a global experience. Uh, this is for the CDN service. So you can use CDN here. Sometimes uh, apart from the CDN as well, so people can use Elastic service. If anyone know about this searching listing, Elastic Cache service. CDN definitely so we cloud can use edge. You are talking about cloud, like we, we can use cloud edge. No, for this I'm talking about the CDN service, cloud front. Cloud front. So there is a one more uh, paid service as well. 
Akamai, Akamai, if you are aware about that. Yeah, but that is a third party. Akamai CDN service. This one. But uh, in AWS, we can we can uh, use that CloudFront service. Now uh, log uh, for layers, we already talked about that like uh, web application. Which will serve your uh, static content or dynamic content to the front end uh, end users. OK, as a public user, then app will handle the business logic, which is like your uh, product information or any particular data. Math, any other operating details about that product, okay, like that. To process that user request. Database details like uh, we can store and manage the application data securely and efficiently. So which whatever the information we want to put there that will be stored in the database. So uh, I hope everyone aware about this website like Amazon Flipkart like that. Amazon.in. So if you click somewhere on the product, let's say this one. So you can see the page, the linking project will be a page will be open here. And this information which we are using, uh, uh, we are getting here. Okay. So they, that's part of the UI, but from the backend side, it might, this image might be stored on the S3 bucket. OK, and this information might be fetching from the database from the backend system. So but uh, whatever the operations you are doing from here, that will be performed by your no, uh, its combination of your front end, your middle layer, app server and your database. So mostly some people use S3 bucket to store these images, but that's very re reliable and uh, best for the performance as well. Because uh, we can we cannot store huge images in the HD you know HD format on the application layer servers, so because it's unnecessary to create the loads on the performance issue on the server side. So that is the reason people mostly use S3 bucket as a storage option there to store their contained images like that. So now coming to the tech stack, which tech stack we need for this? So we required as a for web layer, okay, I mean UI. We required EC2 load balancer. Load balance. Just remember this here, this thing here. I also asked one poll last time, so most of the people might confuse. They're like they can use EC2 instance for the web layer on the public subnet. So which is wrong? We don't need to use EC2 instance in the public subnet. So I will come to that. How we can configure that networking part in the to make it workable? Okay. For web layer, which is the front end. We can use AC2 instance in private subnet. Okay. Then load balancer will be definitely public for the web layer. We can use on the top of that CloudFront S3 bucket for the storing the images content. Okay. And route 53 for the DNS configuration, which we can map the load balancer endpoint in the DNS config route 53. Certificate for the SSL certificate, you can use. Certificate manager, OK, certificate manager on the top of that. You can also use here. I just may forgot for the better scalability. You can use auto scaling as well here. OK. Now coming to this application uh, layer. Namdev. Yeah, Namdev, uh, sorry, I'm uh, interrupting you. What is mm -hmm. this web uh, web layer? Just like uh, for the LP purposing we are using or what? It's a UI front. You can call it as a front end. Front end. Understand. And uh, this one you can call as a backend. Let me remove this word here. For backend, we require AWS EC2. That's also part of the private subnet. You don't so, need to create uh, here yeah. isn't the application layer is the middle layer, not the back end because back end is supposed to be the, the database. database. It should yeah. be the middleware. Uh, this application layer is middleware. Yeah, you can call it as right.
which will handle the logic operation. So for that EC2 instance, you can configure in the private subnet. You don't need to create on the public subnet here. For the load balancer, you can configure internal. If you want to configure load balancer for this, you don't need to create the load balancer on the public side. I mean public subnet here. Only your front end load balancer should be on the public facing. Rest of the things, everything will be in the private subnet for the better architecture and the security in the compliance manner. Okay. Also on the top of that, you can also configure the auto scaling to make it handle the sudden spike in the traffic or something like because uh, if you want to start sale on the e-commerce platform, so there might be traffic surge. We don't know when the users will come okay, during the sale time or something. So they will handle this by using auto scaling as well. Okay. For the database layer, we are using here the RDS and my it's MySQL. And if you talk about the architecture diagram now, let me close this window. Real time, any, anyone, any doubts? Okay. So let me see, draw a simple diagram here so you can understand. Okay, web app in your database. So in this, as we discussed, we will create the EC2 instance, your load balancer, okay, and whatever the other settings we, which we discussed, like S3 bucket and other cloud front something, okay. And the app, we will create the EC2 instance, your load balancer, and MySQL here, RDS. Now in between how networks will we can configure. OK, that is the main part here because as we discussed, we can only. We should only configure the load balancer in the public subnet here for the front end. Rest of the thing, it should be in the private subnet. This one, this both one, OK, private. And so database I, obviously it should I be private. I have a question. Uh, the application layer, so here, because of the application layer, we have to use like we are get, we have to use two EC2 instance that will increase the cost, right? So is there no way where we can just use one EC2 instance but have the application layer uh, like so that the cost is minimized? This is just example, ma'am. Yeah, but like when we are developing a three tier application also in that case whenever, I'm just... you are, whenever, whenever you are deploying the three tier architecture it will be required one or more lbs only that okay if your uh, cloud front or ec2 is there only that required after that application site if whatever the requirements is there with the mm -hmm. application that side it will be required only this is just providing the Namdev is providing the just examples. If this type of uh, it will be required. Okay. So okay. I think you are getting confusing sometimes. Uh, Aparna, are you saying like instead of having this separate layer on the separate instance, we can club into this web server? Yeah, what I'm saying is like, in like we can have a three tier application just with only one EC2 instance like hmm. i have read about that so my question is then why we are using two ec2 instance if we can have See, uh, like three are yeah yeah i can understand your question when we think about the individual user level we can think about that like why we need to invest on the three different environment 
why, why we need to maintain these three instances, right? But when you are dealing with the real time projects, so that mm -hmm. we need to think about the scalability, your other performance, and your security part, and uh, better feasibility. Because let's say you are building everything on the single server as mm -hmm. per your thought. Mm -hmm. So, what will happen if this server goes crash? Oh, availability you, like fault tolerance you are talking when about. You are, when you are dealing with the large scale e-commerce applications, you should not think about like that, like this, like you can build everything on the single server. Practically or you, technically, we can definitely build on the single server, no doubts. But when we deal with the real time project now that we need to separate the infrastructure. If something goes wrong with any one service, so other service cannot impact. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. So that is how microservice works. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. So that's real time based. We need to think about that. Let's okay. say I'm just giving the example here, Amazon.in. Because I have experience in the e-commerce website. If you are aware mm -hmm. about the firstcry.com, I will tell you here. Firstcry.com. This is the baby products, which way where I work around almost three years. So let's say you have some products here. Uh, you choose something like clothes or something. So you can see the different different URLs which will be redirected here and you will see the cart here. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, that not that one, this one. So if something goes wrong with this card service, if you build everything on the same server and that server go down. So in that case, you are even all the microservices also get down there basically impacted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So this all the services uh, you can see card payment options and other maybe uh, I'm not able to uh, get now. But other options also deploy on the different different servers in the backend. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, how it works. So we cannot host everything on the single, uh, same server. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And if so, for the security uh, side, if that server goes compromised, so what will happen? Your all things will be exposed. Your credentials, your logic, or whatever the codes are there. Yes, yes. So that's when we design the architecture that we need to think about that as well. Mm. So that is the reason we normally maintain the three environments in the project. Everywhere you can see your dev environment, your stage environment, like testing mm. or production one. Mm. Why we are not mixing the single uh, same host, right? So that is the reason there. Yes, cleared now. Okay. So here where EC2 and load balancer, we can build in the public pub, sorry, private subnet and database. Obviously, it should be a private subnet, private subnet and public access should be no. So definitely we have seen this last time. If you go on through that video or uh, uh, remember that point. OK, so this is how it works. And now in security uh, group, how we can handle this? That's the main thing here. The security part. For the load balancer security group, so here don't mix or don't use single security group for all the setups. Like load balancer, you are using the security group, same security group you are using for the EC2. Okay, here also you are mixing or using same security group for both resource. So don't do like this. Create separate individual security group for the separate resources here. So you can manage better as part of the security or protocol open. So how we can build this in the load balancer security group, we can open your HTTP and your HTTPS packet for the public one, which because this is a public facing application. Public one. But in EC2 instance security group, you can allow to connect this load balancer. Okay. With a private IP, uh, either you can use VPC CIDR or that sub particular subnet range or security group ID as well. So don't open on the EC2 level security group any port publicly. I hope it's uh, clear on this web layer. Any confusion on the web layer security group open port open? <laughs> No. Okay. Now coming to this app layer, which is the which one? So here, 
you also don't need to open any uh, port number for the public hashing. Neither your uh, EC2 or nor this one load balancer. So which IP you can open here port? Definitely you can open whatever the service running on this EC2 instance, for example. So for this today session, I am just installing the Node.js based application. Node.js based application I have deployed here. So which I am running on this port number 8080. Okay, so this custom port I cannot expose to the public one. So where I need to expose it only expose. Uh, privately either you can use same thing like your VPC CIDR for the internal communication VPC CIDR or particular subnet range or your security group. For this load balancer and this EC2 instance. So don't open this 8080 port to public one. So if you use as a best practice VPC CIDR, so what will happen? So whatever the VPC in in that subnet you configured, let's say is your web application EC2 will talk to your middleware application, which you can say app app layer. Okay. On this 8080 port number. So either you can use this EC2 instance. IP address in this uh, private IP address in this security group or best practice is to you can use VPC CIDR. So why I'm saying VPC CIDR here, let's say web application front end you configured in the auto scaling. Okay, so tomorrow new application new server will launch here because of the traffic surge spike loads. Okay, so that new server will get new IP address, which is private one. It will not get any public IP address. Please note make a note of this. So that uh, how you can manage this manually adding this getting this IP address and adding in this. App, app security group manually that's not possible, right? Because it's a uh, let's say you are handling the multiple projects. So how you can maintain this manually? So as a best practice, so in that case you can use VPC CID range. I will show you that practically how we can open that. OK, so that's a uh, better feasibility. You will get that. And in the database layer. You can obviously it's just forget about the uh, public one here. Okay, so in the database security group, we can use our open port inbound rule for this application layer. Okay, so in that case, either you can use same thing like CIDR range or better feasibility VPC CIDR range or any particular subnet. But uh, instead of using the subnet uh, ID here, you can definitely go with this VPC CIDR. That will you don't need to remember. Like if any new servers come up on the app layer, so you don't need to manually get that uh, private IP address and add in this security group inbound rule. So as a best practice, you can use VPC CIDR range here. So you don't need to worry about any future auto scaling new servers adding there or removing something. So that's it automatically get connected here. So any confusion, any doubts, anything anywhere on the networking part? Can you repeat once again? Yeah. This is your front end. This is your app. And this is your backend database. OK. So in the front end. Your EC2. Should be in private subnet. Load balancer should be in public facing. Or public subnet. Right. App. Whatever their EC2 LB, it should be in. Private one. Private subnet. OK. And database in private subnet. Now, how network configuration we can build it. Now, load balancer security group open HTTP and HTTPS port for public facing. Let me create new one here. Your load balancer will be in public. If any request come to this, okay, 
लोड बैलेंसर इंटरनली टॉक टू योर फ्रंट एंड एप्लीकेशन विच वी हैव डिप्लॉयड ऑन दिस विच इज कॉन्फिगर्ड इन द प्राइवेट सबनेट इन द इनबाउंड सिक्योरिटी ग्रुप वी ओपन एस टी टीपी फॉर द वीपीसी सी आई डी आर If you don't want to use VPC CIDR, then you can use Load Balancer Security Group ID and configure in the EC2 instance inbound rule. Is that clear till now? For the front yes. end. Yes. Okay. Now coming to the, your app layer. Here, EC2. and load balancer this app will work on this 8080 for example because we have a node js based application deployed here okay so when request come from the load balancer is to instance then it will check the app layer which will work on the 8080 so in the, in to configure this communication between is to instance and this app layer is to instance we can use inbound rule here security group and open this custom 8080 port for the this web front end application is to instance either you can use that private ip address you can use security group id okay or you can use as a best practice you can use vpc cidr as i said let's say you are running this two server here okay in the after any traffic surge any promotional or any amount sale something so that it will add more servers here as we configure the auto scaling so then how we can manually get that private ip address and add in this security group that's not possible practically so in that case you can use as a best practice vpc cidr so doesn't matter how many servers are creating there those will get the particular range sub Uh, subnet range ip address right so that will automatically taken care by this range vpc cid range here any confusion in this anyone no now request will route to your whatever the operations you are requesting a request query so that will check in the database tv now security group wise how we can handle this so we can use my uh, we can open mysql port 3306 for this application your app is it instance either you can use same thing like ip address of this is it instance okay or security group id or as a best practice you can use vpc cidr so even we configure the auto scaling here as well in the app server so that also let's say tomorrow or it's uh, trigger the auto scaling and adding more servers so that's uh, we don't need to worry about that uh, just adding getting the new ip address and adding in the database layer In the security group inbound rule. So if you use that VPC CID range, it will automatically handle that traffic. So any confusion or any doubts in this before we starting to the practical? Ah, uh, sir, I have a doubt. Yeah. Ah, uh, so let's consider like uh, if we want to integrate a third party. Ah, uh, so like for the payment purpose. so how mm -hmm. do we can uh, uh, integrate into this uh, three tier architecture so definitely uh, when we talk about the third party uh, architect uh, so third party involvement here like payment gateway or any other services so yeah. they will provide us their endpoint detail which is the api detail so that okay. will we will configure in our code which is handled by the back end developer or front end something so that will comes in uh, uh, this a uh, back end layer right app app layer app layer okay that is basically handled by the developer so we don't need to worry about that but they will provide the details whatever the secrets are there to handle the 
or connect connect to that API API details. Mm, okay, got it. Yeah. Because we, uh, no one can open any API endpoint or publicly accessible because very it's very risky. So uh, if you uh, you, you might uh, aware about that API gateway, for example, OK, so when we talk about the API, it can be your API gateway, which is the managed service from the AWS sites, or it can be your any it's to base a service as well. OK, any Lambda functions as well. So whatever the things, but uh, for the API gateway, we can use their number of uh, security mechanism, Lambda authorizer, secret tokens or like that. So there are a number of security options available that so that kind of mechanism they will provide us uh, details credentials that we can configure in our applications. So that's part okay. we'll handle by the developer team, so we don't need, we need to worry about that. So main thing is as our responsibility, cloud engineer or DevOps engineer. So we need to build this infrastructure. Okay. So for now, today's session, we are definitely going with the manual way. But going forward, we will deploy this through the complete uh, either a CDK code or a Terraform code. So that's we will see. So we don't need to worry about and uh, just click here and there and just set up the VPC, your EC2 instance, load balancer manually. So it will vary a uh, time consuming process. So we can simply just write down the code in the simple in the Terraform or CDK, and we can just simply deploy those by using the single command. So how? So why the company use this DevOps model basically environment? So that's uh, you can build or reuse that code anywhere, any environments. Let's say you want to do, you have deployed something on the web application, any single AWS accounts, and same setup you want to configure on the different AWS accounts. So if you go to the manual way, you know like uh, you will take one week or one hour or ten hours something whatever. Okay. So if you want to repeat those complete setup on the next different AWS accounts, so you will see how it's a uh, hectic and the con time consuming process. So sometimes you also don't know which command you follow or which troubleshooting we have done. So that's a very uh, hectic process. So if you follow that uh, strategy like infrastructure as a code, so that's uh, definitely it's a one time effort, but then it can be reused. Re 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 you can deploy those same code on the different environment. By just few commands only. So that's uh, it's uh, useful by using the infrastructure as a code. So I am also normally say last time also key just take a one time you can try to configure this infrastructure manually. At least to understand which parameters or options you need to select, but next time you can try the same thing for the CDK or Terraform. So that's how you can learn quickly. So just don't depend on the may be manual karunga bad may usko automate karunga. Don't go that. So yeah, we just once you disconnected with that strategy, you will just end up like uh, sometimes we also get bored or abhi ho nahi para hai something like that. Yeah, nervous ho jata hai ki kuch issue aa raha hai. So last time I explained like how you can use Chat GPT effectively by entering the configuration details. So you can just mold your questions properly to the Chat GPT. So now we have a uh, lots of options available there in the market. You can use any other AI tool as well if you familiar with them. So I normally use ChatGPT and use proper like whenever I face something issue. Normally earlier I go with this Stack Overflow, but I completely forget about that Stack Overflow. I rarely go to visit their ch Stack Overflow. Normally I use uh, ChatGPT based on the troubleshootings I am getting. I will definitely show you this like which I set up today. So that's type of questions I ask and just chat GPT give me the proper uh, response here. So everything I configured today. So let's go and just jump to the practical session. I will show you that how I configure. Any questions before that? So definitely one time digestion might be hard, but when you uh, do the hands on practicals for this kind of project, so you will definitely get, get more confidence on that. That how network wheels works there because when we are dealing the different different architecture models, so we need to think about that networking part as well. So networking concept should be clear where the traffic should be. So if I see uh, uh, show you here the simple thumb rule, how network works in the AWS infrastructure. Let me draw the sing simple diagram. 
this is the source this is the target this can be applicable anywhere let's say this is the person normally we call someone okay i am saying hello to this person but he is not listening so what will happen will you get any response back no right so in that case in aws environment everything will be blocked by default in the prior security group if you, if source it can be source your application i mean your front end or something or any any kind of applications if you are calling something someone here or as and the target end if he is not listening to you so you will not get any response back right so how you can configure the connectivity here so always you should make sure in the target security group you should open or allow source then what things you can consider you can either consider the ip address security group id or vpc cid range if you op get this resource id here and open in security group of the target instance uh, resources then you can able to hear back uh, any doubts in this if web application requesting database server if database security group is not open for the web server then how web server can get the response back no right so then in that case we can use open security group inbound rule for web server then only communication will happen otherwise he is sending the request but he is not listening so how we can get the response back so that is the how you can open in the target security group inbound rule for the source services source resources any other confusion or doubts before we start now so don't worry i have already mentioned all the step here in the documentation what things we required then what steps we need to follow like first we can create the vpc instance uh, sorry vpc which has a two public subnet two private subnet and now we will create in this today session i just mentioned uh, uh, forgot to mention we can use here nat gateway so why we need nat gateway because for the as we discuss here we are building web server in the private subnet app server in the private subnet if you want to install something like your uh, apache service node.js package something so by default we know private subnet doesn't have an internet exp uh, exposure here so in that case on the top of that we can we are using nad gateway to support the internet connection and once that app support uh, activity is done like installation of the package then we can remove that nad gateway from the both one like this uh, ec2 instance private subnet and this one okay now we can go with this vpc first okay then we can create ec2 instance so uh, just uh, remember just make a note of this so this is just we are doing the practical so i have not gone gone to the fully scalable like creating the two web server here adding in that load balancer you can definitely if you want to practice definitely you can go ahead that just as simple as you can just add one more server in the front end one more server in the back end as simple as on the top of that you can configure auto scaling as well if you want to do more practicals on this setup okay but as a make to make it simpler so i am just configured the single server here not adding any more services so we for front end we can use create instance in the public so private subnet app layer instance in private subnet then we can create load balancer for the front end then you can also create the front end for the uh, load balancer for the app here 
but for the app you can create the load balancer internally okay not the public facing and then for the database as we have discussed in the last session for the secure database okay. setup yeah, anyone talking okay so for the database here we can first configure the parameter group which we seen last time same thing for the subnet setup. We can create the subnet for the private uh, to make it database privately. Then we can uh, create the MySQL cluster with the Aurora base and multi as enabled. OK, in the private subnet. I also mentioned here additionally, if you want to do practically for that, you can definitely go ahead and just add these two feature here. You, you can create auto scaling and you can also configure the cloud front here on the top of that. So this task will be for you if you can configure that. So that's great. Just you, nothing complex on in that. It's just uh, adding, adding the cloud front on the top of load balancer for the front end. Front end only, okay. And you can also, as I mentioned, you can also create the auto scaling group to make it fully scalable infrastructure as per the problem statement okay or assignment so this type of assignment also you can get somewhere uh, in the let's say you are trying for somewhere interview or somewhere so but as i said you should not configure the console base they will give you like terraform or cdk or something mostly they will give you the uh, terraform task if they give the task for the this three tier, three -tier architecture then you need to build completely from the terraform code not the console base So I have also given here the, some reference links. So definitely you can go ahead and just watch this. Uh, sorry, read. You can you will get simple idea here. <laughs> and the uh, setup wise, I mentioned clearly here like whatever the steps you need to follow. So that's uh, let's say for the front end. For the front end, you just need to create one server. Then just install these packages. Uh, we are for this. We are using Apache here. So last time we discussed about the Nginx, but you can. It's up to you. you if you want to use Nginx, you can definitely go with that. Go with that as well. But for now, I'm just using here Apache servers. Okay. So let's go ahead and just show you that part. So so save the time. Basically, I already set up that. But uh, anyone any doubts or any like don't know about how to create the instance as simple as. Mm -hmm. Anyone here who don't know how to create this two instance? <laughs> Everyone ever right? Let me log in. <laughs> okay. So let me go to step by step so I can show you quickly. So here I just simply create the three tier architecture VPC. If you want to create or uh, don't know how to create it, just simply just go to here, create VPC in the VPC service. And instead of selecting this older method, VPC only, just go to uh, this one, new one, which we uh, see, seen last time, right? So here you can give the name like three tier architecture demo, for example. Okay. Then your CIDR range, whichever you want to mention here, 192 series or 172 series or 10 dot series, which is the private one, which class is basically private class. And here, public subnet, how much we required? We required two public subnet 
and we required two per a private subnet. Okay. NAT gateway we normally don't don't use, but in this case we can go with this one private uh, one AZ here for the to provide the internet connectivity to the private subnet to install the required packages. Okay. As simple as and you can just simply click on this. Create VPT uh, VPC. So you don't need to worry about the other settings. Okay. It will automatically taken care by this new uh, feature. So he will take some time to activate the NAT gateway because NAT gateway activation requires some time. So normally if you have an experience or configured uh, with the earlier version, which is the VPC uh, older method. So in that case, you need to build everything in the manual way, like uh, say sim separate, separate, creating the subnet, the route tables, internet gateway, NAT gateway, configuring the subnet association in the route tables like that. So those all entry you need to manage manually, but in this new workflow, you don't need to worry about that. It will automatically taken care. So instead of waiting here, so let me simply go to this VPC because I already built that to avoid the any time consuming process. So let me just refresh. And delete that one because we don't require. I already built this VPC with the same method which I have shown. So it will not allow me to build a delete because that NAT gateway is in process. So first I need to delete that. It's in pending state. It's it will take some time. So let me delete this one. It's clear, right? How we can create the secured VPC. Anyone any doubts? Just no. let me know if anywhere you are getting so I can just understand that this you are getting right way. Because lots of settings are there. So that is the reason I initially say uh, told like there are lots of things in the wall here. OK, I will delete it later. No issues. Let me rename it. So we are using this one, OK? Just only one, one more settings you need to do after the setup of the VPC. What is that? That uh, let me filter it out here. And here, see for the public subnet, you can you need to just enable that settings. Okay, you can just select only public setting, uh, public subnet. Okay, from the action, click on edit subnet setting. And you need to enable this option by default. It's like this not check, but you need to enable this option to get the public IP address. When you try to create any resources in the public subnet or load balancer, it will get the IP address. So just you need to enable that and just click on save button. OK, so I already done that. So same thing for this one action and edit submit setting. I need to enable this option and just save it. OK. Now VPC part is done. Just one minute. Huh? Let me close the unnecessary tab here. Now once set VPC setup is done, go to your EC2 service. Okay, you can just simply search from here. EC2 service here. And uh, which EC2 instance we required now? We required your app server and web server. Okay. So let's configure that. So I am not going to launch, but I can show you that steps basically how you can launch it. Click on launch instance. You can give the name like demo. The reason uh, why I already created the resources because uh, to make it stable and this initialization, it's take a uh, couple of minutes. So that's it will uh, increase the time with wait, wait time. So that is the reason I already set up that, but I will show you that as 
just quickly demo web server or you can mention at a front end to make it clear okay and just based on your choice like whatever the you are using in the project either imagine linux or ubuntu you can go with that and instance type uh instance type you can go with this either you can go with the basic one like t2 macro t3 macro or something or c4 series based on the workload you have okay and then for now you can go with this simple one t2 macro key pair which we are configuring for the front end applications okay so we required pem file here if you already have a pem file so you can select from here drop down list if you don't have you can simply click on this and give the name like demo web PMQ, whatever you want to keep. Select PAM format and just click on. Click create key pair. Okay, so it will automatically uh, create the key pair and it will automatically download here. Okay. So for now, I already did that so I can select that option web server. Okay, which I already created here. Let me show you. Here web server. OK, I already have that PM file. Now under the Nitro settings. Here is the uh, main thing basically. So here select the proper VPC which we have built. Which one we have built? Let's say three tier architecture VPC. Just select that. And here. Instead of selecting the. Public subnet. OK, these are the public subnet. Don't select the public subnet, select only private one. Redire architecture subnet private one. Okay. Then it will automatically disable this option because for the private subnet, we don't require any public IP address. Okay. So that's it automatically disabled. Now coming to the security group, you can give the name like security web security group and you can just launch it okay if you want to open port here as well you can definitely open here or even in later part you can also manage that security group firewall okay if you have already existing created you can just select from here and you can just select from the list here and just launch the instance this is for the web server And same setting, you can uh, same setup, uh, same way you can use uh, launch one more instance for the app server, your middle layer. Okay, that that also should be in place in private subnet, not the public one. So let me filter it out here so I can show you the details. So just forget about this app server and web server if i open this security group i will show you how i configure that so same thing like i just shown okay in the just only select the private subnet don't select the public subnet there okay that is only the condition and if you go to this security group if i open this security group in the new tab so i have just given the name like web server security group and inbound rule you can see that port 80 port i am just open i just open for the vpc cidr range not the public facing one like 00, zero or something because that's i explained in the architecture diagram how that build on the top of security group of the load balancer not the ec2 level okay so load balancer will talk to ec2 instance front end ec2 instance internally not the public one okay that is how it traffic routes. So that is the reason you need to give the. 80 port open for the internal only. VPC CIDR range. From where you can get the VPC CIDR range. Go to this. VPC service. Just click on your PC. 
Let me delete this. Okay, so if you see the VPC, uh, you will see here CIDR range. Okay, so, this, so that's you can just simply copy and add as an inbound rule here. Click on inbound rule and you can just simply add here. Add rule, select the port, let's say HTTP and just paste it here. I already added, so that is the reason he is showing which one I copied. Okay, if you want to give any description, you can definitely go ahead and add that description and just save that rules. Okay. Also, you can see the one more inbound rules I have added here SSH for the same VPC CID range. So I will come to that Bastion server, which is the additional concept. So how we can connect this private server, right? Because uh, those are the private subnets, so we cannot directly connect from our local machine. So in that, uh, as we discussed last time, we use Bastion server on the top of that. So Bastion server will be hosted on the public subnet. And you can connect your Bastion server first. And then you can connect. I will come to that part, okay? So this is for the web server. If you go to the detail part here, you will see the details. Just scroll down a little bit. You will see here. I don't have any public IP address. OK, because I don't require public IP address in this theta architecture. I have only private IP address here and there is no public DNS as well. Then everything is private one. You can see the VPC which, which you have selected. And here subnet. Okay, you can see three tier architecture subnet private one a app south one a okay, which is the private one. So other details you can see here key pair and the other AMI like that. Okay. Same thing for your app server. If I go to the detail part here, you can see for app server, we don't have any IP address. Uh, I mean public IP address. You have only private IP address and private DNS. Also subnet you can see this is this configured on the private subnet. And in the security group. You can just simply open the security group in the separate tab. Just. Okay. Here also you can see the inbound rule. Okay, don't go to the outbound rule here. Only check the inbound rules. SSH and SSH you can see I have only open for the private, uh, which is the VPC CID range, and on the app server, which is we are, we are deploying the Node.js based application. As I said initially, we are using this on the 8080 port number. Okay, Node.js. So that's the reason I have configured 8080 custom port here for the VPC CID range. So how we can open the custom port number? Because if you see the standard protocol here, you will see the traffic, SMTP, SSH, DNS, HTTP. But let's say you have something custom port you can you cannot find here in the standard protocol. So in that case, you can select this custom TCP and add those uh, port custom ports and you can which of the source you want to add to allow the permission that you can add here the details and just save it. OK. So that is how configured. SSH I added for the Bastion server, which is I configured. Either you can add specifically Bastion server IP address. OK, that's also absolutely fine. And just for the better feasibility, I just added the 
UPCC ID range. So let's say tomorrow one more Bash and server added. So you don't need to just add the get those private IP address again and just add that in the inbound rule. So that's uh, within a CID range. It can automatically work. OK. So this is how the setup of this. App and web now coming to your database servers. Any doubts till web and app app. Front end and app. So how do you configure the LBs? Yeah, I will come to that part. Let me just show the database here and then we'll come to that part. So as last time we discussed about this secure uh, database. So before directly jump to this database creation. First, what things you need to set up as a prerequisites? First, go to the subnet group. OK, and add only private subnet group here. Don't create any mix like public and private subnet group. OK, because we want to completely keep our database in the secure and the private manner. So don't go with mix with that public and private. So if you watch my last video, you attended somewhere. OK, so that you can get the idea. So how you can create the subnet group? Just click on subnet group. Give the name. Description. And here, let's say we have this. Three tier architecture VPC, you can select that. Availability zone, let's say two availability zones here. In the subnet, let's say with the subnet ID, we cannot identify like which one private here. OK, so what we can do is here. You can simply just open the VPC in a separate section. This part I already explained, but let me just repeat that. The last uh, database project we already discussed that. Just click on this, get the VPC ID. Come to this subnet. Filter it out here, OK? And you can see. These first private one and private two, OK? Just get only this ID. EAD DCF. OK. ECF and EAD just select only private one and just create it. That's it. And you will see like this DB server, for example. And then parameter group which we create for the database optimization point of view because the default parameter group we cannot edit as we discussed last time. So we need to create it customized, which is the uh, additional one basically. So how we can create it as simple as you can just simply click on this create, give the parameter name, OK, whatever you want to give description and here engine type. So for wh what database you are trying to create the parameter group. So as this project we are building for the Aurora MySQL, so you can go with this. If you if you are trying for the different one like MariaDB, MySQL Community Edition, Aurora, My Postgres, or any Windows base or Oracle base, you can definitely go and just select that. OK. And just. Choose the family which version you want to create it and just create it. OK, that's the simple process uh, how it is. Once this is done, then you can come to this. Database setup. So let me quickly show you the options which we already discussed, but let me recap the, those. Just click on the standard case, uh, select the engine type Aurora MySQL the version, okay, 8.0, which is the latest one. I mean, latest table one. Then you are, you can give the database name here. Let's say demo DB. Credentials you can store the secret manner in the secret manager service. Username you can keep as it, whatever you want, like admin, root, any DB admin, something like that. And password will be generated in the secret manager. If you want to give the self self managed password, you can just select this option and give the password here. OK. But as a best practice, we can store the passwords in the secret manner in the secret manager service. And this is the KMS which will automatically use as encryption. And instance type which you can select either whatever you want to set up like uh, Take like T T three large, medium, or any other larger, based on the use cases. You can select that, 
And for here, better availability and durability, we can select multi-AZ for the three-tier architecture. For the dev environment, as I said last time, dev and test environment, you can definitely go with this single one for the because lower environment, we don't require high availability. Only for the production one, you can go with this. So normally when we uh, do this setup through the CDK code, so we use if else statement there and we define this like if production environment, then go with this multi AG. If lower not equal to production, then go to the single one instance. So same thing you can configure in Terraform as well. OK, that logic you need to define there. And select just important part, select the proper VPC here. If by mistake you selected any wrong VPC and you set up that, so you cannot change that VPC again. So you have option only recreate the instance with the proper VPC. I mean database. OK, so that's make sure you are selecting the. Right. VPC here. OK. And based on that which we configure the subnet group, it will automatically pop up here. Public access should be no because we are configure building in this private one. Now security group, if you have existing one, you can select from here list. If you don't have, you can just simply create it new one. OK, I will show you the inbound rule and rest of the things are it's up to you. Like we want to modify, enable the monitoring or other options. And just simply just click on create it. So you will see like this. One writer, one, one reader instance, OK. Anyone aware about this? Why we required writer and reader, or in which use case? What is the use case of this writer or reader? How you can use in the application? Anyone aware about this? OK. So basically for write operation, we use this writer instance and for the read operations, we can use reader operation. Uh, reader operation for read instance we can use. OK, so let's say if someone want to uh, configure only fetch the data from the application. So in that case, that's you need to share this endpoint detail details to our developer. Either front end developer or back end developers, you can share the. Endpoint, so you will see the endpoint here. If you click on the this and just here endpoint name, writer and reader. So that's a uh, developer will uh, configure in their opera code basically logic. So if any read calls, they will ca add the reader endpoint. If any write calls, like any submitting the data from the front end, something like that, any user creations happen, right? We normally sign up somewhere. Let's say any website. Let's say GitHub. Okay. So he will ask about the sign up process if you don't have any account. So that will store in the backend system. So that is how you can configure for the writer one, but that's part of the developer team. But you need to share that credit uh, endpoints to them. So they, based on the logic, they can update accordingly in code. Okay. And one more part is if something goes wrong with this master server, last time I tested it from here. So you can also, it will automatically promote. Read an instance to writer one automatically, okay, from the back end. We don't need to worry about during the failure. Failor. It will automatically handle. So this is done with the database and credentials will store in the secret manager. As I said, you can use secret manager service here. Just open that and you will see like this. If you read how you can get the credentials, if you just click on this retrieve secret value, you will see password like this. Admin username and password and endpoint you can use this writer endpoint. This one. To connect uh, from the any applications. OK, so now I'm coming to this actual. Next step. On the load balancer site. So till now we have built the web front end, your app and your database servers. OK. Now. Come to this. EC2.
load balancer. Okay. You can see this is the web ALB. But how you can set up that? Create simply click on create load balancer application one. And here give the load balancer name like test. Here you can select the internet facing one because this which is we are building for the front end application and for the app middleware you can go with this internal one. You don't need to go with this internet facing. OK. Internet facing for the front end and just select the proper VPC which three tier architecture VPC. Select the zones. And security groups as I said. Se create separate security group for the load balancer. OK. So for that you will not see option here. You can separately go to the EC2 right clicking. And come to this scroll down. You will see under the network and sec security. OK, just click on here. Click security group. Give the name like. Front end LB security group like this description. Whatever you want to keep, okay, and select the proper VPC. And you can add the whatever the inbound rules, let's say HTTP and HTTPS. I want to open here <coughs> for the public one because this is a public facing application, and you can just simply create it, okay. And now coming to this. Here you don't see any target group, OK? Which is a uh, where to send this traffic. So in that case, click on this. Create target group. Because load balance are required target group, right? So uh, choose target type instance. Give the target group name like web LB target group. Give the port number, it will automatically keep whatever. Three, three tier architecture VPC. And next. Here you need to select the right instance. Let's say we are building this load balancer for the front end. So you can select the web server here. Okay. Click on include as a pending and just create target group as simple as. Okay. Once you create that, you will see the list here. It will automatically come here like this. OK, you can just simply select that. And on the additional part, which because uh, we need to configure the SSL certificate as well, right? As we seen that we required SSL certificate to make the website secure. So just select listener HTTPS. OK, select the, that target group which we have created and just scroll down a little bit. You will see you need to select the certificate here, whichever the domain you are using in the project. For now we are using uh, I'm using AWS Guruji.net, but in your case, let's say you are building for the in real time project. So whatever the domain they are configured in the route 53 that you need to select. But before that you need to request the certificate. So how we can set request just search ACM certificate manager service. Right click in the new tab. And you can see whichever the domain I have, I have purchased the SSL certificate, which is the free of cost. But that you can use within an AWS service. Click on request. Request type public certificate. Next. Give the fully qualified domain name, whatever the domain name you want to use. Whatever the domain you have. As a best practice, use wildcard certificate. Okay. So on the top, Prefix whatever the subdomain you uh, configured that automatically supported by the certificate. Okay, so that is the reason you can use wildcard certificate, which is the best use for that. And validation method you can select DNS validation method. Okay, so it will automatically create the DNS ent entry in the route 53. And after a couple of minutes, like one or two minutes, it will uh, sync and uh, you, you, you will get the certificate. Just click on request, that's it. And you will see it like this after a couple of minutes issued. You just need to refresh it. In case uh, it might be delayed somewhere. So in that case, what you can do is just click on that particular certificate. And you will see option here. 
create record in route 53. So you can simply click on this. Okay. And whatever the pending records you will see here. As of now, you are uh, not able to see because I already uh, configured that. So you will see pending uh, records here and just simply click on this create uh, create record. So it will automatically create the record in route 53 service. You don't need to go and manually add those records. This one C name records. OK, it will automatically add it. So this is the process how you can request the certificate. You can select here and just simply review the changes and create load balancer. So within a couple of minutes, it will be in the active state. OK, because in initially you will see like provision state. So once you fully stable, it will see like this active. OK, if you click on this web LB, you will see all the details here. And if I show you now security group, OK. Only HTTP and HTTP ports are open publicly, but that is only for the applicable to security uh, load balancer security group. So that is the reason I said don't mix security group for or one use uh, don't use one security group for all the resources because for the web server you want to use any uh, open any custom port. So that's unnecessary. That's applicable for that load balancer as well. Okay, so just don't uh, try to use that. Create individual security group for the each services for the better security. A listener, you can see target group we have attached properly. Okay, that's uh, registered and it's in a healthy state, which is the web server. Okay. Now you can copy this where load balancer DNS name and go to your service route 53. Open in new tab. If you don't have any domain name, as I said earlier also, you can use only the DNS name If you have. You can definitely just then use this route 53 service. So I have this practical domain AWS Guruji.net and here I already set up that here. If I search web. Web dot AWS Guruji dot net, which is route to the that load balancer. OK, so this is how you can configure the DNS entry. And now how you can verify that DNS entry is configured properly. DNS watch dot info you can verify here. And just paste web dot that domain name basically web dot aws net and just click on resolve so you can see the resolvable ip address here okay now this is we have done from the infrastructure side like uh creating creating the app server web server database load balancer now what about the uh next move like setup so that's complete setup i have mentioned here Front end, but as we have created front end in the private subnet, so how we can connect this private server from the, our local machine? That's directly not possible, right? So now we can create passion server here. Uh, I have mentioned here. No, so I can mention the additional ninth step here. Create passion post on public subnet. OK. It's a similar like AC2 instance creation, not. More than that, but. The only one thing you need to take care. Let's say instance. Launch instance. Give the name like demo. Bashan Ubuntu 
instance type keep as it is key pair we can create separate key pair here okay which i have already down downloaded bash and host here okay so that is the reason i am not going to create new one but in your case if you don't have just click on this create new one and select the pem file and give the name and create it okay it will automatically download now the main part is networking setting here you can just select three tier architecture vpc and here instead of selecting the private subnet select the public one okay three tier architecture public one subnet okay that is the only the settings here you can do and keep the security group separate for the bastion host i have already created so i can just select from here like a uh, bastion host and just all good and just launch it okay it will take a couple of minutes to launch it but i will show you which i already built here this one bastion host go to the sec you can see here we are getting the public ip address and private ip address okay because that's build 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 upon the public subnet and you can see here three tier architecture subnet public one okay if you check the security group open in the new tab bash and host security group and here i just open only ssh port for now practical i just open publicly okay because i don't have any vpn setup now but in your case in the real time scenario we can use vpn ip address here as a inbound rule okay so you can connect to your company vpn first then you can just connect to this bastion server so i don't have any vpn uh, ip address so i just use here zero zero okay public one now we can try to connect first this bastion server by getting this public ip address you can use putty here okay you can you add the ip address then from the ssh auth credentials and add that private ip address here okay bastion host and then just click on connect okay so it will allow to log in but i already save this session here you can also save the session like this give the name like i'm just giving here demo passion so next time if you quit the putty if you next time open that okay putty so you will not uh, no no need to add one all the details again and again so you will get the automatically here uh, saved session okay so i already added here so i am just loading that and just connecting okay so i am on the bastion server now you can see the ip address 166 if i verify the ip address 4.166 okay now what next step uh, next step is required i have already mentioned here so you can just get that can I, okay you have create here bastion server let me mention the process so that you can refer later process to connect i think i mentioned below but let me change the path okay now that's one here okay process how to connect web and app server from bastion host okay use putty and connect bastion host 
once you connected your bash and host copy the web server uh, temp file on the bash and server okay so this let's say this web server ip uh, pem file you can just simply open it and just copy this okay copy this complete line and just paste where you can paste i have already pasted but let me show you in the backup folder okay this okay then one more thing you need to do because permission related by default you might see in 6440 permission that's uh, you you will get error like permissions are open and you are not able to connect to your web server so in that case you can give the permission like chmod 400 read permission to this key okay which i already mentioned here the documentation okay and now how you can connect from bashan to your web server through the command line okay anyone tried before uh, from one linux machine to another linux machine yes Sorry, your voice is very low. Uh, yes, sir. I tried connecting uh, from one Linux machine to another one. Okay. So this is how you can use uh, the method like. Uh, let me go to that. Okay. And here, SSH insert the key, which we have copied here. Uh, username on the target machine. Okay, as we build a web front end EC2 and uh, app uh, completely based on the Ubuntu, so we will get the by default username as a Ubuntu there. Okay, get the IP address of the web server. This one, so private IP address. Okay, we don't have any public IP address here. Copy it and paste it here, and that's it. So uh, we are able to enter now with the in the web server okay how you can verify that you have a connectivity working i, I mean internet just ping on google.com as of now it's working internet connected because nat gateway is already configured there okay which we have set up right the vpc method let me but in new method you are getting that option automatically but let's say in the if you try to set up your pc with the older method so you will you need to configure it manually how you can configure let me go to the vpc section copy these vpc ci uh, vpc id paste in the route table okay not subnet and just click on private private route table and see here route entry one private table doesn't have that nat gateway but another one it has nat gateway okay if i remove this entry let's say by default you will get like this and if i try to ping now the internet will not work okay because I just removed the NAT gateway from that private route table. If you want to install in your case, if you already build get that because in the new VPC method it's uh, automatically configured. But in suppose if it's not configured, so how you can do this? Because we need to install the Apache package here and the uh, on the app middle layer, we need to install the Node.js something. Okay, on that. So by default, uh, without internet we cannot install, right? So now it's connectivity is not working so how we can add the internet connectivity go to that private route table go to the uh, route entry okay and add the edit, edit route click on add routes network and your select the 
NAT gateway. It will automatically create uh, pop up the NAT gateway here, which we have created already. Okay. Just select that and save the changes. That's it. And you can see now the traffic is coming. Okay. So now you can use these, these commands to install the package. Yum update, then Apache, and starting the service. Okay. And once you're done with that package installation, you can simply remove for that. NAT, for the NAT gateway, we need to give the particular location instance. For example, we have uh, we need to give the uh, for the Red Hat URLs only. So how we can provide that? Uh, which one? For the NAT gateway, we need to give the access only for the Red Hat URL. Red Hat U, uh, update URL. Where we can uh, update the packages and other things. So how we can give that? So rest or, of the things you want to block it. Yes. So that maybe you can manage through the repo something on the Linux side. So that's I not work or not come across that kind of situation. Do you have any paid support or because, in configuring uh, this? Uh, because thing is that whenever you are clicking on the uh, edit route. There is an option mm -hmm. is asking you are giving directly a uh, destination 0.0.0. .0. So from there we can uh, can we select some of the IP addresses and other things. As I can see the ranges here. And can we manually the... type some IP addresses or. I don't think let me try. Let's say this city is OK. Hmm. The valid CIDL, uh, which is one minute, 24. Hmm. Yes, I think it's possible. I think uh, you just uh, go to the uh, redhat.com and uh, just check with the NS lookup. Uh, from there, we get the some of the uh, particular IP addresses. From that, it will be possible or not. But if you give this or the, let me try. If I'm giving this range, how it works with destination. If I try to check the internet connect with now. That internet connectivity is not reachable. Please change it. Hmm. For the internet connectivity, we need to give that public one. But we'll check uh, in the destination part what else other options we can add here. Okay. So once that is done, you can install the required packages and just once that is done, you can just simply remove it and just save the changes. So now we don't require internet connectivity on that. So you can see it's gone. So once you're done with this, just you can just uh, as of now, I have don't have any fully functional website now, but I have just copied this. Uh, simple hello, hello to uh, welcome to e-commerce site. Okay. So I think Ganesh last time you asked about this command. So it's basically T command. It will take input from this command and put output in the target one. So that's uh, how it how it works. So this will take input and uh, put the output in this index.html file. So let's go to that directory. Where dub HTML. And just click on the, check this. OK, you can see. Welcome to my e-commerce website. Okay, site. So I am on the web server now, not on the Bastion server. So check the status, uh, service status. So it should be running. Okay, to make it on boot, when the it's let's say tomorrow server got rebooted or something, 
make it system CTL enable Apache 2. Okay, it's already. Okay, I'm not in the root, so you should have a root privileges. Okay, and you can use this command. System CTL enable and service name. I have mentioned here as well, so don't worry. So now as we uh, said, like we need to map the uh, configure the DNS entry by load balancer. So if I try to visit this website, so let's see what output will come. So you can see uh, the changes which we deployed on this web server. Welcome to my e-commerce website is working. If you want to change something here. Let me. Add something here. Instead of site, let it let make its platform. OK, and just save these changes and refresh the page. OK, welcome to my e-commerce e-commerce platforms. So this is a, a website. Now how we can build a, or integrate in this uh, front end to uh, your middleware app. OK, so for that. Any doubts till now to set up the front end? OK, the next step. I will come to this additional configuration, OK, the reverse proxy. So let me jump to the. App server now, so log into your. App server, how you can log in same process. Just get the IP address. Of the app server. This is the same like private one. And here. Just come out from the web server. OK, this is my private IP address of the Bastion server. So now instead of web server, just change the IP address of the. App server, so for both server, I use same key. So that is the reason I am not changing, but uh, you can also change, create a new app key pair. For the login mechanism, PM file, and you can paste it here and you can use that. OK. So now I am in the app server. So same process like you can just attach the NAT gateway and just install the packages, which packages uh, yum update, uh, sorry, applicate update, then your Node.js and NPM unit install. OK, because this is a. Node based applications. So once that is done, you can remove, remove the that NAT gateway connectivity. OK, and now this is the sample. Uh, Node.js application code here. I just get it from the chat GPT. So as simple as just working on the custom port 8080 connecting to the mic uh, database. OK. And you can add the database details here, username, password, database name, and this is the simple logic like just printing the output. And if I use the URL like you will see the this hello from the application layer. And get the output from the database. OK, I will show you this both way. Also, additionally, you require to install this supported package. The NPM install express and MySQL. And. There is a two method so you can use uh, start your applic Node.js based application. You can use a default node and then app.js. OK. Or another one is like PM2. If anyone aware about this process manager for the Node.js, OK, because in Node.js, if you use this command node space app.js, it will be active uh, till the prompt active. OK, if you re remove terminate this terminal, that service will be down. So to avoid that, we can use this PM2 process here, process manager. So that will taken care automatically. So I will show you that as well. So I already. Copied the code here. 
in the I created the folder app. Okay, inside the app, app I have this app.js. If I cat it, you can see all the details here. Like your uh, RDS endpoint, your database username, password, database name, and the remaining query. Okay, so this database credentials you can configure additionally. Okay, how you can create it? So for that, let me show you. From the back end, as we discussed in initial network architecture, back end system can connect to your uh, sorry app middleware. You can connect the, to the database server. OK, back end. So here. Can use this like this MySQL space hyphen H for the remote host. Uh, give the RDS endpoint name, then hyphen U credentials, your admin and hyphen P password. So once you enter here, OK, and he will ask the password. So let me copy the password which I created. OK, uh, you can also get it from the. Secret manager service. Let me open that. Secret. Click on this. Retrieve the password. Copy it. And. Paste it here by using the right click of the mouse. You will not see, but it's a feature of the Linux. OK, so I just copied the password and see if I show the execute the query show databases. Something spelling mistake data. Basis. OK. I have this e-commerce database. If I use this database here. And try to see the tables. So I have created the two tables just for the practice purpose. So but our main table is products and that product has all the information. If I try to run the query, select star from. Products. And you can see there is there is a two entry I just configured. OK, this is the product name and the price and the description. OK, I have everything mentioned in this documentation, so don't worry. You just need to follow uh, carefully or there. Every steps I configured here. OK, this is the creation of the database. How you can create the username, okay? Table, then how you can add the entry in the table as well, right? So all the information and the uh, guide I have mentioned here, so you can configure like this. Once that is done, you can just come out, and that information I have added here. Now, how to start this service? You have two options. Either you can use that node. Node and give the. Let me go to that directory. Node app dot JS. OK, it will start. On this terminal, but if I open this terminal and close it again, that application will be down. OK, that's a not good practice. So in that case, you can use process process manager for the node JS, which will automatically take care. I have already given here the little bit uh, link here. If you want to learn uh, interest in the that to just to understand the what is the PM2, you can just go through and just read it. But as simple as it's just a process process manager of the Node.js, so he will keep your applications alive, even you uh, quitting from this terminal. Okay, and installation simple is a very simple method. Just uh, do this command npm install PM2. Okay, and that's it. So now instead of using this Node command. We can use PM to start app dot JS. OK, and you can just simply press enter here. So I already started it so you can see the status PM to status. App dot JS. OK, you can see app name and your status online. OK. This PM to is very interesting command. You can see logs as well. Like this, okay. So if you execute the command like node space app dot js, you will see like this connected as ID. And if you uh, close this terminal, that application will be end. 
Okay, that's the reason I use PM to here process manager. Now how you can verify that is working fine. You can simply. Okay, I will come to that additional setting now. This is done till now. Uh, your front end, your uh, app. Okay. Now from the front end side, what we need to configure. Because this we need to integrate right with the front end and your app. So I will come out from this. Which one app server. Now I can connect to my web server back here. Okay, 234 IP address. Let me go to this. Apache configuration slash etc. Apache. And go to this. Site available. And open this configuration. Okay. Cat 00. Or if I open in this. You will see properly. So here by default front end will work like this. But on the additional side, we need to configure like this, like proxy server. OK, proxy will act as a to send the request to the particular server. OK, so in the front end. Front end application configuration, you need to pass the, this uh, three line. OK, so here you just replace your app server private IP address. Which you can take from here. App server private IP address, okay, 13064. Once that changes it done, you can just verify the syntax Apache 2 CTL hyphen T. If everything goes well, you can just simply restart the service like this, okay. Now So in reverse proxy watch endpoint we have mentioned for this app server slash products. OK, so if we. Add. Products here. So that request will come from the app server, not the front end. So that's proxy server will route that request to your application server and you will get the output. As we seen, we have configured our app server in the private subnet. So still it's working because as a top layer a load balancer we have configured on the public subnet, but on the back end side, then uh, connect com communication connectivity we have configured internally. Okay, that is how the request will serve from the back end. So this is the one logic. So if I change here a little bit, so I will show you one more logic uh, output here. As I shown <coughs> database entry, right? So just one changes I need to do here. Let me show quickly. <laughs> Instead of giving the products. If I. Sorry. Go to the line number 30. And remove this products. Okay. Let me check the syntax and restart the service system CTL restart Apache 2. Something it's a spelling mistake. Okay. Now let me visit that. See. So I'm getting the response from the backend database. So you can see as of now two entries. If I add one more entries here, let me show you quickly. So for that, what I need to do, I need to log into the app server because from app I can connect to my database server. And just Connect here. Get that password. Paste it. Okay. Show databases. 
use e commerce or you can just simply just copy paste okay now i can add one more entry here okay as of now, what entry you are seeing, you are able to see the ID 1 and ID 2. If I want to add something here as a third one, cosmetics product. Price, let's say 100. And this is the cosmetic. Cosmetics product, OK. And I just re put this entry in the database. And just enter, OK. So now if I refresh this page. You can see third entry has been added. OK, this is I'm just showing giving you the example manual like adding the entry in the database, but uh, because I'm not a good developer. So in the real time cases, so there there is a from the front end. This will happen. Let's say we are adding the entry or sign up something. So that's that logic or uh, we are uh, registering the users, adding the details that will automatically uh, happen through the front end to that database. It will store the information. OK. So that's how the developer front end developer will write the logic or back end developer. But I'm just just to show you the understanding. I'm just showing from the manual way. But this is the how you will look like this. So I think that's all for the today's session. If anyone any doubts, so let me know because there are lots of things you need to take care. And uh, I'm sure you can if you build this project, so you will get some confidence because lots of things are available. You need to perform. And all the steps I have mentioned here. In case you get somewhere any issues, just let me know or send me the screenshot so I can just guide you based on that. Any questions from anyone before wrap up? Um, the, what is it? Uh, I think uh, you heard of a message on tomorrow. You're not available at the morning time. So could you please suggest us uh, what time? Uh, what time uh, our class is getting <coughs> connected? 